They brought him out of the hills, over the narrow, twisting passes where the enemy feared to set foot and where the horses no longer led but followed. They carried him on one of the litters for the wounded. When he awoke to find himself on a stretcher, he only rolled his eyes to look at them and made no protest. For a day and a night, they crawled up and down the mountain wasteland, a silent, dogged caravan of men, horses, and mules. When they reached the valley, a crowd had gathered at the northern gate. But as the caravan entered, the shouts of welcome died on their lips. Why did the procession enter the village so silently? Why did the litter bearers walk with their eyes fixed on the ground? Then they saw the stretcher coming slowly through the gate. Here we go. Quiet, please. On Jag. Slate up. Roll it. You got it. Mark it. 26-1, take nine. And action! It was in January of the year 1938 that a Canadian doctor named Norman Bethune came to China. He was a hard-living, temperamental man, a brilliant surgeon, a fervent communist. He came here to serve as medical advisor to Mao Zedong's 8th Root Army in their war against the invading Japanese. In less than two years, Norman Bethune would die here, and he would become a hero to one quarter of the human race. Was it perfect? It is 1987, almost half a century after Bethune arrived in China, and an international movie crew has come to recreate his story. The working title of their film is Bethune, The Making of a Hero. Actor Donald Sutherland is Bethune. Like the man he's playing, Sutherland is Canadian, and he's wanted the role in this movie for years. He's lost 45 pounds and taken a third of his usual fee to do it. I think what I want to do is come slightly higher and come back. Director Philip Borsos is also from Canada. 34 years old, he's best known for The Grey Fox and One Magic Christmas. The cinematographer is Michael Malloy, who shot A Clockwork Orange. Eventually, both will admit they've never worked on a film like this one before. Neither of the producers, Nicola Clermont and his partner Peter Krunenberg of Montreal. They've raised a budget of $13 million. This will be the most expensive and ambitious Canadian movie ever. The project is also tremendously important to the Chinese. For the first time, they are full partners with a Western company in the production of a motion picture. The co-director, along with Borsis, is Wang Xingang, once a Chinese matinee idol, now vice president of China's biggest film studio. Of course, in recent years, many Western films have been shot in China, but none of them has been made this way. As Borsus begins Bethune, Bernardo Bertolucci has just completed The Last Emperor, and Steven Spielberg is finishing Empire of the Sun. But both of those films had Western crews who stayed in Western hotels in the big cities. Even so, Steven Spielberg spent just two weeks in China and completed his film during three months in Spain. But Bethune is a co-production. Canada, France, China. The Chinese will account for three million of the $13 million budget. They'll provide food, accommodation, transportation, equipment, and personnel. Bethune, come behind the camera. In theory, Western and Chinese crews will work together equally. Okay. Ready? Here we go! We knew from the very beginning that it was going to be um, a little bit of a of a voyage into the unknown. Producer yes. Peter Krunenberg. Films had been shot here, but with a totally foreign crew, so that they had everything. They still could shoot in their own rhythm. 
And this time it was going to be um, a real co-production where the two crews had to mesh. They had to sort of uh, synchronize. Why was it done that way? It was the only way that this film could be financed. In the spirit of the true co-production, you're not getting from the other party just uh, trucks and uh, certain supplies and other things that otherwise you would buy. Nicola Clermont. You also get some of the key people. And I think it was also very important for the Chinese to feel that they are true co-producers and that some of their crew do effectively take part in the production of this film. The Chinese partner in this venture is the August 1st film studio of Beijing, which specializes in war movies. Named for the date in 1949 on which the revolution was won by Mao Zedong and the communists, August 1st is operated by the People's Liberation Army. But many of the 120 August 1st technicians are soldiers who were assigned to make this movie, with the result that the key jobs belong to the 29 Westerners. But as production starts, Philip Borses is confident that August 1st will give him what he needs to tell the Bethune story. If you get the character working wonderfully, you can play it anywhere. You could play it, you know, as they have done. You can play it on a stage, you know, in one room. When you want to start adding the layers to it, you have to add uh, 5,000 Chinese, 8th Root Army, uh, camped on the banks of the Yellow River with uh, bonfires all over the place and the Japanese five kilometers away, sending artillery in and Bethune sitting there and crossing the Yellow River with artillery going off in the middle of the river. Um, that's the kind of thing that I thought it was because that's what he did. It's all written down, it's all there. The man who wrote it all down is Ted Allen. Now 72, a large part of his working life has been dominated by Norman Bethune. So far, two books, a stage play, and now this movie. The two men first met in Montreal in 1935. A year later, when Bethune worked with the Loyalists during the Civil War in Spain, Ted Allen was there alongside. A few years afterwards, when Allen learned of Bethune's death, he began to work on this screenplay. Bethune has taken longer to get made than any other movie in the history of the film industry, for I sold it to 20th Century Fox. I sold not a, a screenplay, because people say I've begun writing screenplays since 1940. No, in 1942, I sold a 185-page uh, biographical outline to 20th Century Fox, and they were going to make a movie, and I was going to write the screenplay, but the political situation changed, and they never... Meaning what? Meaning uh, that the anti-communism got to be very popular in the United States after that marvelous pro-Russian feeling during the a war against the Nazis, um, many politicians developed tremendous careers just by being anti-communist. You could not make a movie about a Canadian communist uh, working with the Chinese communists. Remember that the United States didn't recognize China until Canada did. 17 years after Canada first recognized the People's Republic of China, 45 years after Allen sold his first Bethune outline to Hollywood, the Chinese have decided to co-produce, and his movie is finally being made. The star, Donald Sutherland, has also admired Norman Bethune for years. In fact, he once owned the movie rights to a Bethune book himself. He was an intensely intelligent son of a missionary. He was a renegade. And when I read his letters out loud to myself, and it sounded like they were coming out of my head. I, I loved him. I just loved him. I loved him. Number 25, one, take one. Set. Action. Heads off. It is June the 4th in the city of Yunnan, 600 kilometers southwest of Beijing. During the war, this was the headquarters of Mao Zedong. And in this scene, Mao and Bethune say goodbye after talking all night. Bethune is on his way to the Japanese front. Mao has just given him permission to build a model hospital there. 
It will be a symbol of what Chinese medicine can accomplish. The two men would never meet again, but Mao would later write of the Canadian doctor as a shining example to the Chinese people. What kind of spirit is this, wrote Mao, that made a foreigner, without any selfish motive, regard the cause of the Chinese people's liberation as his own? To this day in China, Norman Bethune is a household name. But the relationship between Mao and Bethune isn't the important one on the set today. There has been frequent disagreement, often over seemingly minor matters, between director Philip Borsus and his Chinese counterpart, Wang Xingang. We've got two directors. The true director is Philip Borsos. We have a, a Chinese co-director. First like assistant director, there, Pedro Gandal. The respect of uh, everything that we represent as being Chinese. And from time to time, we do hit snags whereby the Chinese feel that they don't want to show this in this way or represent this in this way. And at that point, uh, Wan Chenggang, which is his name, uh, will step in and speak to, to Philip via his translator, and then sometimes an argument will ensue, well, we want to take poetic license here or whatever. And then once they've thrashed it out, uh, we just execute it. I, he's trying to find a, a rationalization. Yes, yes, yes. We must live, We must be the mediators. <laughs> something that an interpreter knows well. <laughs> the dispute of the moment is about this water bucket. In the script, it's to be carried by a peasant. But Wang Xingang says it should be carried by a soldier. He sends word to Borsus through his translator. Carrying the water. Wait a second, no peasant? Uh-uh, no, there's a peasant. No I, no, I asked for a peasant about three months, four months, five months ago. And Wang Xingang just have told you that it's no good to have present here because the whole compound is... Uh, well, he's not in the compound, he's out in the road. Yeah, but still, that's the, this area. Uh, no, you see, we talked about this five months ago, four months ago, three months ago, two months ago, one month ago, three weeks ago, two weeks ago, one week ago, three days ago, two days ago, one day ago. And there was always a peasant. There was always a peasant. There was always, a peasant. There was always some guy carrying water and he was walking along the street there. We talked about this, remember? We talked about it with the ADs. He's uh, talked about it with all you guys. They, they can't do this. You can't just say yes and then not show up. So go get a peasant. So I think that uh, you should talk to Mr. Munch and go. No, no, no. He has to talk to me and tell me that it's not going to be here. Because as far as I'm concerned, it was fine and it was going to be here. You can ask Wang Xingang to find him, not me to find Wang Xingang. As far as I'm concerned, in about 35 minutes, there's a peasant walking along there with buckets of water. But for Wang Xingang and the Chinese government's man on the set, Shen Shiwa, it's a question of artistic license versus historical reality. Mao's headquarters was a military zone, Wang says, so there couldn't have been a peasant with a bucket. And uh, this film is a bit different than any other film because actually this is a film just like a biography of a Bethune. And uh, also, in this film, there are many historical uh, persons, yeah? They are, some of them are still alive, uh, still alive. For instance, General Nye, he's still alive. And also, uh, many important uh, people in this film, um, Chairman Mao Zedong, and he's a uh, historical important person and also Bethune, he's a real person. So such a film on some principal points we have to respect the historical um, reality. Because this is not a film created by someone, by the uh, writer, you see? It's a true story. And walk off right down here. Back on the set, the scene is about to be shot. And there's a man with a bucket, all right. But he's not a peasant. He's an 8th Fruit Army soldier. And cut! Cut! This round to the Chinese. 
After three weeks in Yunnan, the production is about to move on. The crew will go to the Yellow River for a two-day shoot. But most of the equipment is being packed for a longer journey, 400 kilometers farther north to the Wutai Mountains, where Mao and the 8th Route Army face the Japanese. Transportation Captain John Gretzner, a 26-year-old from Toronto, is the man responsible for organizing the convoy. Gretzner speaks English, French, and Chinese, and he needs them all in this job. In fact, he needs them all right now to referee an argument between the lighting crew, which is part French, part British, and the Chinese drivers they claim have mispacked and manhandled their expensive gear. And the electrical Gretzner's position has the potential to be a logistical as well as linguistic nightmare. He must keep two dozen vehicles moving in a country where the trucks are old, the roads are bad, and where drivers can be the most temperamental members of a movie crew. Chinese drivers have a, a very special position in society because most people, except for drivers, don't carry a license. And the same thing, most people don't have private cars. So driver is an institution that you have to respect. Uh, what did you, you tell me the other day? A man who controls his drivers in China can be an emperor. We want him to pull forward. At the moment, Gressner would likely settle for getting the driver of this truck to move forward a bit so the lights can be repacked properly. The driver says he'll be pleased to, as soon as he gets his engine back in one piece. Ah, uh, that's a problem. No support. <laughs> The Bethune production has already covered a lot of territory. The film started shooting in Beijing in the middle of April. Early in May, it moved to Pinyao, 400 kilometers south, then to Yunnan, 200 kilometers west. Still to come, the Yellow River, then the mountains of the Wutai. All of these are places few Westerners have ever seen cut off to travelers since the revolution ended in 1949, there weren't many tourists here before then. The Bethune crew has been on the road for six weeks now. The producers, director, and others on the production staff arrived in China as long as five months ago. And as the film heads deeper into the heart of China, there is a growing sense of isolation on the set. You're taking people who come from a society where they have access to newspapers, video, film, radio, stereos, television, and they're coming here and none of that's available for them. Their friends aren't available for them. Their friend, family aren't available for them. No one, except for a few exceptions, speaks the local language. So people are forced into a small community. And therefore things, like a family, things escalate and relations develop that are very tight and very emotional. And it's the goods and bad part of a family things don't dissipate because people don't forget easily in these situations because they don't go away from the person that's just offended them or just pissed them off. Martin, I could use some help here with the eggs. Food is the single most emotional issue. Set photographer Alan Markfield of Washington, D.C. has spent the past three weeks cooking after the crew simply refused to eat the meals prepared for them by Chinese chefs. On two days, there was no bottled water. Once, the menu included dog meat. Then there were the unidentifiable chicken parts, meal after meal. And the things you saw in that uh, kitchen were just uh, like no other. I mean, it's um, a medieval kitchen. The food is, uh, what can I tell you? You walk into a kitchen where you see a man smoking a cigarette, the ashes dangling into the salad. He's mixing the salad with dirty hands, black under his fingernails. 
cooking with rancid animal fat. When they carve up an animal, they take the fat from the animal and throw it into a big wok that's never cleaned and it's just heated. And then you wonder why people get sick. There are no location toilets, honey wagons as we call them, so that you uh, have your business and you, um, you do it in an open field. No water in your room, no hot and cold running water of any kind. Uh, very, no hot water, uh, cold showers when you can get them. I have never, ever, ever, and uh, I've worked on a tremendous number of movies everywhere from Africa to the Antarctic. I have never worked on a film where personally we lived and worked in the kind of conditions we work on. Living and working conditions in these remote parts of China are essentially the same today as they were 50 years ago when Norman Bethune was here. I sometimes dream of coffee, rare roast beef and ice cream, Bethune wrote, our books still being written, what do clean sheets feel like in a soft bed. And ironically, in a movie about the man who brought medical progress to this part of the world, access to medical attention is another big concern. When the crew wouldn't consult the Chinese physician on the set, the producers had to bring Dr. Francis Gorzalka from Montreal. Basically, the whole crew just ran over. You have to help me. I haven't eaten. I'm throwing up. I've got a stomach ache. And everyone else, we have no water. We're all sick. Uh, it looked, I mean, they'd been surviving really under very bad conditions. I mean, having no water was completely unacceptable as far as I can see. And it was a 90 degree day with the sun, the sun up and, and, and no water. Film people are very, I remember just entering this business, film people are very well looked after. I mean, it's a great vocation. You get up in the morning, someone has a car waiting for you when you're working. They feed you, they take you to work, they feed you at work. They take you home, they organize your hotel, you put your laundry in a bag. Uh, you know, you're used to staying a Holiday Inn or the Hilton or Intercontinental Hotel or something. And you get all these things nine months of the year and then three months you go back to wherever you live. And a lot of them live in places with good tax shelters so they have villas. So they have a very nice life. And then when they come to China, which for the moment is foregone some of those pleasures for another goal, it's a strange contradiction. But you would think that because the story is a story of self-sacrifice, that these people somehow would want to be uh, true to the story they're making and be willing to forgo some of the things they're used to, the same way Bethune was, to make the story, so to speak, the same way Bethune was willing to, and he, if you look at his background, was certainly a man who appreciated pleasure. You can't say he was a Philistine, forgo those pleasures, and it's in the script, do they still you know, play Beethoven, do they still write novels? These people aren't willing at all to come close to even to what Bethune was willing to do to make their story. At the time that I came out, the, the two main issues were lack of food and lack of uh, health and safety standards. And I think I was brought in really as a stopgap measure to say, well, you know, you want a doctor, here's a doctor. And uh, also because the crew was in really in such revolt at that time, they were really desperate to help me on their side so that I would say, yes, the food is in childbirth, and yes, the situation is, is, is not safe, and so on. And, and I was caught between them and the producers because during that time I knew that virtually, they were, this was before they had stopped working, but you could feel it in the air. They wanted to stop, and I knew that anything I would say would make them stop. So it was that makeup man Jamie Brown of Calgary, the crew's representative, told the producers that if living and working conditions didn't improve, they would go on strike. Jamie made sure everything we had asked for was in writing, and we asked for writing back to say, yes, we understand. Special effects coordinator things. Neil Trefunovich from Toronto. Date. And then they said, okay, it's coming, it's coming. They didn't make that date. We gave them three more additional days. They didn't even get any of the uh, requests done by that time. So we decided that maybe we should show that we really meant business because we all kept shooting up to that point, and everybody decided that they would just stop work until something was done about the issues that needed to be covered. They don't know it in China, and they won't see the newspapers for weeks. But back in Canada, the strike is headline news. Things accumulated. The country was too different from 
a vision, sometimes maybe a little bit romantic, that they had of, a, of the faraway China. Um, certain things were definitely underestimated uh, from our end, production end. For example? For example, uh, the fact that uh, the Chinese food, although it was promised to us that it would be as Western as they could make it, was just not Western enough and they got terribly uh, fed up with it. As far as I'm concerned, I think the big difference is, is China. The fact that you're shooting so far away from your home base, the fact that you have a, a crew which sometimes does, sometimes doesn't really mix well. Um, the crew is very important. That's your backbone. There's nothing you can do without it unless you have their support. And the logistics and the fact that too many difficult things that came together into this film. You can deal with one, two, three at a time. Sometimes it becomes difficult if you have to deal with 12 problems at a time. Here on the Yellow River, there is a kind of uneasy truce. The producers have brought in the doctor. A chef is en route from Montreal. Steven Spielberg's catering truck is coming from Shanghai. But the strike has taken 24 hours of valuable time. It costs approximately $50,000 a day to shoot this movie. After seven weeks of filming, Bethune is already 10 days behind schedule. For the people who live along the Yellow River, for whom life has changed little since Norman Bethune was here, this production may be the most exciting thing they've ever seen. Here, as at the other locations, the Chinese assistant directors round up local talent to work as extras. Although it's not exactly a matter of asking for volunteers. I don't think that there's an application process. I mean, people are just enlisted. You know, you're going to be an extra tomorrow. What the ADs will do is approach their particular work unit. Everything, this whole society is broken into work units and in whatever endeavor you do. And they will uh, approach the, the leader of any particular work unit and say, okay, uh, we need uh, 50 people tomorrow, 30 children, whatever. And uh, sim these people are simply assigned and uh, they get the same remuneration that they would normally do for, for whatever they do as a living. Only on that day they don't go to the field, they report as an extra for a movie. So what they will do is they'll pick it up and they'll start walking over this way to near where the gramophone is. I need one of these crates already off. Unfortunately, the theory of the co-production isn't working out quite as well. One example is the film processing. It was to be done in China until the Canadians discovered that sand in the Beijing water supply would scratch the negative. Instead, the film must be sent to Vancouver via Frankfurt. And the daily 12 to 16 hour work routine is taking its toll too. Three of them are over here. There are some conflicts going on between the two sides. Translator Wei Hang Fen often finds herself in the middle. I mean, our social system is totally different and uh, we have different social values and the work, let's say, working attitude. For instance, a Canadian crew uh, has to work very hard, otherwise he will have the possibility of being fired. But in China, it seems not so likely to happen because uh, everybody is paid the same. No difference between how you work or how much you do. There's no difference. So. Some lazy people will just stay there and uh, without doing anything. And if they have to cooperate with the Canadian crew, there's always argument. For instance, I want you to do something, but you are very lazy and you don't want to do Just get very angry. <laughs> I don't want a goddamn car on the goddamn sand. It's 86, the car. It's making Who asked the car to come here, Pedro? Jesus. So, can we have the, the 12 porters over here in a group? See what happens when the car comes down here? The Chinese were from the very beginning treated like uh, people who could carry things, you know, because there were so many of them. They were never really given responsibilities. 
And the one thing that demotivates somebody immediately is not having any responsibility. As for the living conditions of the Chinese members of the production, they eat and sleep separately at a local army base whenever there is one. And they don't quite know what to make of the Canadians' complaints. China is a poor country, especially compared with the advanced country in the world. And uh, they are very easily satisfied. They, they don't complain a lot. But sometimes when it's too, let's say, uh, the condition is too filthy, then they, they will complain. But uh, as for the Canadian crew's complainments, I think they, are, they won't be able to understand them quite a lot because they don't know much about how your people are living in your own country, how, what are the things you eat usually. They think that's good enough for, for chi Chinese people. So sometimes they don't understand. Veronique. <laughs> Veronique. 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 Oh. Good. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Oh, Canada. Veronique Gabillot, the boom operator from Montreal, is one of the lucky ones on the crew. She works with her boyfriend, Patrick Roussel, who's the sound mixer. But she has also made an effort to make friends with Chinese members of the production, like Lao Fei of the art department. Not everyone has. No, they, that's. Well, that's not that they don't understand, but they don't try to communicate with them. First, there's the language, language problem. But even with that, I mean, I don't speak Chinese, and I can have good relations with certain people like Lao Fei and a lot of Chinese people in the crew. And um, they're a bit, again, well, how can you say, not racist, but I mean, they, sometimes they treat the Chinese like badly and um, I I don't like that very much. <laughs> After the trials of the Yellow River, Pinyao and Yunnan, the crew has been promised that things will get better at their final location in the Wutai Mountains, where they'll spend the last two months of the shoot. Not far from the border of Inner Mongolia, the Wutai is about as close to Shangri-La as you're ever likely to get. Buddha spent time in this valley as a young man, and Chao Shu has been here all his life. He's 85 years old now, an old Buddhist monk who lives alone in this abandoned monastery. No one told him to expect guests. For the next month, Chao Shu's home will be commandeered as the Bethune set. The lights have finally arrived from Yunnan, five days late, but only slightly the worse for wear. In all his life, Chao Shu has never known electricity. Now his onion patch lies under two tons of lights. In 85 years, Chao Shu has never seen a movie, never even seen a picture of himself. But I'm saying in one case you have a high concentration of active bacteria, right? How would you express that? This morning, writer Don Miller is consulting Dr. Francis Gorzalka about medical terms for the script. Use an operation. I presume they washed the instruments after, but maybe not. Miller has recently arrived from Los Angeles to polish the screenplay in the absence of Ted Allen, who's returned to Canada and isn't expected back. What they'll shoot here are the hospital and surgery scenes. Across the courtyard, Philip Borses is talking to the art department about the doctors' and nurses' gowns. What is that, alcohol? He says they're too new, 
and too clean. This gentleman is a doctor who works in an operating room every day, so maybe he could, maybe they could consult with him and go over it, so he could say, okay, that looks, that looks like an artery got loose, and, went, and this looks like he wiped his hands, whatever. There is no shortage of blood in the special effects tent, where Barney Berman is also preparing for surgery. He grew up in Hollywood with his brother and partner Rob. Their father designed the makeup for Planet of the Apes. This is the boys' first big job on their own. Well, right now I'm just powdering the leg for an operation and coloring the flesh tone around it, yeah. And what are you going to put in, inside the hole? We'll be using a, a gelatin base material, gelatin blood, if you will. And we've rigged blood tubes to it so that we so can... Blood's going to go out yeah, during so can, the... They can stick like a gauze down inside of it and pull it out and it would be this blood, just like a real operation. You do not romanticize, idealize the 8th Route Army right off the top in the movie. And I, I, I have that conflict here and we're going to resolve it right now because now's the time to once and for all, you know, decide. If they are going to have any aprons at all. There are not going to be a lot of them. Not everybody's going to be wearing them. But they'll be stained and used and used and used and used and used. Now, Morses had thought he'd convinced the Chinese about the blood-stained gowns. But now Shen Shi Hua and Wang Xing Gong seem to think that that might make them look bad. Of course, other, uh, when Beijing Bethune came here, maybe only a few people have their, you see, Head and, uh, but you also could not say that before Bethune came here, everything is in a mess. I'm not saying that. You don't understand. I'm really not saying that. He doesn't believe 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 that. He doesn't all uh, these doctors with these cameras on it. Why didn't you say it? I did say so. I said so then, I said but before then, I said last that. week. I, I keep saying, saying it. And I am told to shoot the movie and get the movie shot. <laughs> Meanwhile, the Burmans have been having their problems too. Just moments ago, their tent collapsed. This is only the second scene on which they've worked since they arrived in China. In the first, the corpses they constructed <laughs> fell apart in the Yellow River. Today is the Burmans' chance to redeem themselves. I don't know what they can do with their tent. Although the artificial leg comes through unscathed, they still need a live patient for the filming of surgery. And assistant director Dao Cho thinks he's found his man in one of the local Wu Tai extras. Dao explains that the extra will play a soldier who's been shot in the leg and is operated on by the legendary Dr. Bethune. But the lucky candidate doesn't appear convinced that the operation will be theatrical and not the real thing. <laughs> But before long, escorted to the set, he's being prepped for surgery. Still not entirely convinced. There'll be two kinds of surgical shots done here, close-ups of the artificial leg and wider shots of the live patient. This is stuff for Donald to pick at. Yeah, good, let me have one. Pull stuff out of there. Well, that's just Kleenex. Yes, Kleenex soaked in, uh, soaked in blood. Does that look like muscle tissue? 
for these long shots. The pieces shots. of muscle tissue that I saw them taking out. This is just very wide. This is now, Kleenex. Let me, and, uh, warn me which is his leg, because I don't so, suddenly want to. This is all his leg, except for these little bits of stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> little things like this that are obviously not. So that if I see a, f a fresh rough of some, a slightly different consistency of blood than that, I know that it's his. That's right. That's right. Okay. That's, that would be a good sign. He doesn't speak English. Mm -hmm. no. He he will when you make the cut. <laughs> <laughs> More so so yeah. <laughs> yeah. Drain the blood from the wound with gauze. Open the fascia, retracted it, and now we're going to cut away the devitalized muscle. Good question. Yeah. There are four ways of telling whether a muscle is alive or not. Color, consistency, circulation, and contractibility. Now, this muscle is too dark. There's no capillary bleeding. Capillary or capillary? Capillary or, are you sure? No. That's the way I've always heard it. No capillary bleeding, no capillary, no capillary bleeding. It's too soft. You pinch it, and it doesn't contract. Cut it away. Cut away everything that's dead. Okay. Bethune had some sheets here, and I want this covered. He's not a director. He's never directed a film. He's not a producer. He's a um, uh, vice president of the studio, but but a, and an ex actor, but a, a wonderful actor. So in talking to the Chinese cast, he's very 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 helpful. Um, in my opinion, he's also very hurtful because he he is also entrusted with the party line and carrying the party line. And when I say the party line, you know which party I mean uh, into the fabric of the picture specifically for draping patients in the operating room. It's gotten to the point where he has to be embarrassed in front of everyone. I embarrass him in front of everyone in order just to have, to have some filthy looking bandages. Where did they get this material if they don't have sheets for the patients? Hand Nicola, I mean, I don't, do you know what I mean? I'm still trying to keep the logic of the thing together. Bethune, Bethune actually arrived with sheets for draping patients in the operating rooms, okay? As well as all kinds of other stuff. If we're here the reality was they were incredible people. Their spirit and heart was stunning. But they didn't all have clean uniforms, you know? And they didn't all have clean sheets on the beds in the hospital. I can understand that Philip gets angry sometimes. Speed is very important in making films, and occasionally there's a problem with the set or prop don't arrive on time. Then I can understand him feeling that way. But other times, I'm afraid I don't understand. The generation who fought alongside Norman Bethune has seen a great many things change between China and the West. For decades after the revolution, there was almost no contact with the outside world whatsoever. And now that the official Chinese policy is an openness to the West, the legacy of Norman Bethune is still at the very heart of this country. He was a man before his time, a Westerner who came to China because he shared their goals and their fight. It is why the story of Bethune was chosen for this first film co-production, and why it is important for the Chinese to do it well. Look and go. Ernie Day is a veteran British cinematographer whose credits include an Academy Award nomination for A Passage to India. Because time is short, Day's been brought in to direct Bethune's battle scenes. The camera's here, comes to a stop. 
Stands up. Bam. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 好了，走了，预备，开始，走一遍。Just let me wash the thing. Okay. 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 Here he's got his hands full with one soldier from the People's Liberation Army. We better tell him that if he's going to smile when we do it, we'll have to shoot him for real. The Chinese simply see movies differently than Westerners do. In China, there are fewer resources for films in the first place. An average budget here is about $250,000 a picture. So there's less money for big special effects and less money to repeat a scene until you get it right. But none of that really matters, according to the Chinese, because after all, it's just a movie. <laughs> oh, Jay, the man with a sword right, is running like this. <laughs> Still, it's becoming clear in this production that the Chinese may have promised more than they can provide. Things that they were to deliver, like aircraft, we talked and talked and talked about the aircraft, and it went from, yes, we'll have aircraft, to no, they couldn't have aircraft, to uh, we can't deliver aircraft, to we, us, the Canadians, will bring in the aircraft, and you can't bring in the aircraft because you can't fly it in China, and then a Chinese pilot can't fly the foreign aircraft who will use models to, okay, show us the models. And this was all in the first two or three weeks, and we've not yet seen the models, and it's July 3rd right now. Yesterday, I think it was yesterday, it was on a truck from Beijing, but last week it was on a truck from Beijing that had broken down. And the two weeks before that, the guy that was supposed to uh, operate the models was not available. He was on another picture. I mean, every excuse in the world for not seeing the models. So I start to say to myself, I started to say to myself three months ago, there's not going to be any aircraft. But assistant director Dao Cho says he believes August 1st has done the best job they could do. In order to do what's expected of us, we have to know what's going to happen in events. But when you come to the set in the morning and the director is always changing the script or changing his mind, it's very difficult. This isn't the way we make movies in China. Even when you've got the People's Liberation Army on your side, it's difficult to make a movie that's an epic on a budget that's not. And with just 10 days to put the battle scenes together, both time and patience are running out. Now, did you tell me he was standing up or sitting down? Did you tell me? Look at him. Okay, sorry. Uh, he, he will kneel down. Well, I, I just need him to do what he did in the first take. We didn't estimate it right. Neither did we, because we relied very much on, uh, on what they they told us what they represented to us. Okay, that's a print, Debbie. Rely on what they say, rely on them when they say, don't worry, it's going to be there, it's going to be ready. And you don't know it until the last minute. And in many occasions, it just wasn't ready, for whatever reason. Also, on many occasions, they wouldn't let us know in advance that it's, it's not going to be ready. Is this maybe a Chinese way of working, or maybe they were concerned, losing face? saying that you failed, saying that you can't deliver, that you can't make it. I think it's a combination of things. And I discussed with them many times because still our relations are quite friendly. 
and uh, I tried to explain how important it was for us to know in advance if something w wasn't to be delivered instead of finding out at the last minute when you're cornered and you just have to shoot it the way it is because you have no choice. But it still keeps happening and probably it will until the end. Well, I just happened to have here hot off the presses. You read the other ones? Most afternoons, Don Miller arrives with changes to the script, a job originally done by another writer named Dennis Clark. The need to change Ted Allen's screenplay has become a sensitive subject. You are not recording this shit. Mayo. Mayo documentary. It means that it had been through so many drafts, so many times, I mean, I think 40 or 50 drafts, Ted told me, that it, it, it became diminished. Which, which happens when you go draft upon draft upon draft. Not always, but it depends on the period of time. And, you know, you need, you need fresh brains, you need fresh brain cells, you need vitality. In the first case, the Philip Borsos felt, because he had not worked with me on the script, he wanted, he said, a friend of his whom he knew, to um, write a lot of narrative description which I don't do. I don't do it in my scripts. And he's used to that, said he, and uh, that's basically what he said he wanted Dennis for. I said, fine. I saw no reason to object to that. And so I agreed. As it turned out, Sutherland wanted many more changes than just narrative description. <clears throat> as far as Don Miller was concerned, Don Miller was my choice. For by then, I had realized what Sutherland was attempting to do. It began during the first scene shot back in Beijing. Norman Bethune arriving in China by train. Alan wrote him hungover and haggard. Sutherland played him, clean shaven and sober. Sutherland has a different concept of Bethune than I have. And my feeling was that he, kn he knew he did and he should never have accepted to do my script. Uh, I know that when, when everybody came here and met me originally, they said the film, the script had to be changed. And I presume that was why they hired a writer, um, another writer. The, uh, yes, uh, the, the script was uh, needed to be changed. Yeah. And they proceeded to change it. The result of all of this is that many mornings at the monastery in the Wutai, Mr. Shen can be found translating from English to Chinese for the day's shoot. He said he got this script two hours ago at 5 a.m. Is this the way films in China are No, doing? never. <laughs> never. Why? This is very special to, to, uh, to the Chinese film group because usually in China when we uh, film, make a film, we will fix the script even months ago. So the script before is Before shooting. Long before shooting. Long before shooting. It stays <laughs> yeah. that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, stays that way. Of course, sometimes we will also change a little bit, but not like this. Not so often, and not, uh, you see, uh, so short time before real shooting. Yes. Thank you very much. Yeah. I'm sorry, I have to work, otherwise yeah, they will have no script to shoot. We were very paranoid about it to begin with, but over a course of three months, they, I believe, have become resigned to the fact that the foreigners will change the script on whim. I mean, they don't, they, I don't think they even necessarily understand that it's being improved in some ways. And in some ways, they're right. It isn't being improved. But it has to be changed to be improved in other ways. But it is totally the opposite to the way they, they normally work, you know. They're, they usually have a script a year in advance and don't change a word. Yeah. Uh, so let's say, explain the problem. Uh, me, yeah, okay. Uh, can, I, can I just explain the problem? If, if Bethune does this, okay, you're going to change every dressing and every bandage, okay? If he does that, it's no good for him sitting here waiting because he's so enraged he would just turn and leave. The changes are not only inconvenient but expensive. On two days, production must be canceled completely because there is nothing to shoot. If I, if I did turn and leave there, if 
he could say Daifu. Mm -hmm. Today's script has arrived for a pivotal scene in the Bethune story. The surgeon tours the ward of a local hospital. Afterwards, outside, he publicly scolds the man in charge, whose name is Dr. Fong, for the dismal conditions he's just seen. In the story, it's a very sensitive scene for the Chinese, who place a great deal of importance on saving face. On the set, it's a sensitive scene as well, because Bethune's character and the impact that China had on it are at the very heart of the dispute between Sutherland and Allen. <laughs> Mr. Fong can start repaying his debt to these patients by finding them some proper bedding. Let's see if he has the skill to be an orderly. That's much better for me because it's wonderful playing it off of him. Bethune changed in China. He was transformed in China. I don't think Southern sees it that way. Well, I think he feels that Bethune was an extraordinary man because there's no question that Southern uh, respects and, and admires Bethune. Well, I, I, I see, he seems to see him as a man who goes through life like some white uh, great angel uh, among the natives. I don't disagree with Ted. Uh, um, you know, I, I truly don't. I truly don't. When he's right about Bethune, I agree with him absolutely. Uh, absolutely. And he's a, he's a very sweet, gentle man and... and uh, and I don't want to really get involved with some of the kind of problems that he's going through at the moment. And uh, I, I would never, ever want to hurt his feelings, ever. I don't have a vision of Bethune. I know the man. And I, he was the most exciting man I ever knew. And I loved him. There were times I hated him. Because we had a, I think, a rather intense father-son relationship. He was like a surrogate father to me. So... As far as I'm concerned, I am reporting what Bethune was like. He looks at Fong. What about Dr. Fong? What, 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 he, he what, should, he what, what shall Dr. Fong do? With what Ted do? Allen 12,000 kilometers away, the final word belongs to Sutherland. What, what should he do? Yes, Dr. Fong. What should he Mr. Do? Fong can start repaying his debt to these patients by finding them some proper bedding. Let's see if he has the skill to be an orderly. And then, and then... Listening to the Voice of America. A land Voice of America. The Israeli-occupied West Bank turned violent Sunday. A Palestinian villager was shot dead. July, in the beginning of a fourth month away from home for the Bethune crew. The Wutai Mountains are such an isolated place that the producers have twice driven 24 hours round trip to Beijing just to make a telephone call. For the people working here, the outside world seems very far away. But as they had been promised, living conditions have considerably improved since the production got to the Wutai. Spielberg's catering truck has finally arrived from Shanghai. Pierre the chef has come from Montreal. And spirits seem higher than at any time since the film began. Rice pudding? Oh no. That looks like you can do a bit of decorating with it. <laughs> well I thought I might go and put your I, I, with I, that. Well, I was gonna take it back and re and re re the room. Well. <laughs> there are even jokes about the food. I've got a map of China, I could stick it up with that. <laughs> In fact, the labor troubles of the Yellow River and Yunnan might be just a faded memory if not for the Toronto newspapers which have arrived on the set today, reminding everyone of what they've been through. Alan Markfield, is he? Oh, terrible still. Dear me. Oh, it's peaking Yellow River. Revolt. What's that? I, uh, what about Alan Markfield? Let them no longer eat dog meat. What's what? that? Huh? What I would like you to do is that from the per that you have, that you should cover the cost of breakfast and, and supper.
After dinner tonight, producer Nicola Clermont meets with the crew. So far, they haven't had to spend their $30 a day expense money for food, as they might during a shoot in Canada. But now that the meals have improved, Clermont wants them to make a contribution. So, let's discuss it. Let's see what you think. I have spoken to a few members of the crew because I wanted to know whether this seemed fair or not. The response I get, yes, it seems fair. Now, again, if some people don't agree, then we'll have to talk about it. Um, I don't know how we can go, what else I can do. We can't go and eat somewhere else. I mean, uh, you know, <clears throat> we're talking about different countries. In Montreal, when a producer uh, asks you to eat some, somewhere, he pays for it. If you don't have the choice to eat somewhere else, just, he pays for it. We're going to have a vote at the end, but for those of you who object, or for those of you who agree... The crew's representative time, is makeup man uh, Jamie this Brown. This is what I want to hear, uh, all of your comments, yay or nay. So if now, if you have anything to say, please let us hear it, you know, so that we can discuss it afterwards and come up with, with, an, with an answer. Parce qu'en réalité, je suis pas intéressé à manger tout le temps du chinois. Donc, en même temps, si on paye une partie à la production pour le repas du soir, ce qui serait bien, c'est quand même de bénéficier aussi des services du chef, forcément. He says he doesn't want to eat Chinese every evening. So if he gives some money up to the production, it would be to eat Western from Western time food. to time. Yeah, and I not only eat Chinese that. every night. Yeah, right. You're saying we really not ready to pay for the, the breakfast or for the, the supper we're getting at the little hotel. First, there's a lot of Chinese food, 80% of it goes back. It's no good, it's not worth money. Okay. On the other hand, now we're catering lunch. I can tell you the lunch is costing uh, the production $25 per person. We said, fine, we're going to cater you the lunch, give it to you free if you take care of the two others. But now you're conditioning the price by the quality. So I'm reversing and saying, all right, let's talk about lunch. Is the lunch worth something? We are the lowest per diem in the world in Quebec. You know that. I mean, there's no, it's, we have always been the lowest per diem in the fucking world. <laughs> The other film that shot in Shanghai, uh, which is a pr French production of Bellan Candelarme, they had less per diem than this. Yes. No, they didn't. Well, <laughs> you okay, want to bet well, on that? Okay. You want to no, bet? Want... Okay, one second. Okay, I'm going to have to interject. Nicholas tells me that the completion guarantees are coming in three days and we have to solve this tonight. There's well, no tonight there's... or at least before he comes. Well, or at least before he comes. In the film business, the completion guarantor is a bonder whose job is to assure that a production is finished on schedule and on budget. If it's not, the guarantor is financially responsible. Nicholas just said he had to have his, his answer in three days. We can prove to them that they're, they're saving a lot of money. We're already giving them a lot. And if they don't agree to that, we can tell them, OK, well, we'll go back to the way it should be, that we should stop every five hours. And if you don't stop, it's in double time or triple time. And we should have a meal every five hours and see what they think about that. And they'll then very quickly understand it will cost them a lot more money than what we're discussing just now. I think, Nicola, we're helping you in our hours no, the, the, and, our, <laughs> and our work and our waving a lot of things. I mean, we work, we work eight days in a row on certain occasions. With it, and I don't think it's an, uh, per diem is an issue. We are a good crew. We're a happy crew. Every one of us here enjoys the company of each other and for some reason at all it seems if it's been stretched apart why I don't know because everybody on this film wants to finish it that's that's the truth of it coming from me there is an emotional side to it because I know that you have been through certain things and I would like to make an effort on the other hand I would like to prove that you're making an effort too that it's not just the production paying I would like to have some arguments because if it isn't the case, they usually what they do is just walk in and they say, well, okay, here's the contract, fine, that's what the contract says. I think you've had plenty of arguments right here tonight. The arguments for me, they're not usually an arguments for a completion bonder. I don't know, they sound pretty good to me. We've put in hours and hours and hours and hours unnecessarily trying to solve not only our problems, but also production's problems. And I'm getting awful tired. So let, let's, let's, let's come up with a logical solution. Either we don't pay any per diem towards the production or we pay per diem, but let's do it. Let's do something. Okay, if you don't want to contribute any of your portion to the share uh, of your per diems at this particular time, let me see your hands. If you, don't, if you do not want to contribute any amount of your per diem to the, to the producer at this time, let me see your hands.
It's okay, not unanimous, but the crew's answer to Clermont is no. To complicate things, they grumble as they go to bed that the per diems they've been arguing about have been held back until the matter could be settled. They even give us money for all this fun. The following day, the per diems are paid. The completion guarantor will eventually arrive, but the subject of meals and expense money will not come up again. And producer Nicolas Clermont is optimistic, despite all that he and his production have been through. We're running about three weeks late. Um, and not over budget, we are well into contingencies. Just, just about finishing them. It's time for us to get out of here. For this film crew, as for Norman Bethune himself, the saga in China will come to an end in a remote northern valley. It was during a Japanese air raid that Bethune cut his finger while operating without gloves. He cut his hand four or five times in the course of his time in China. But this time, septicemia set in, blood poisoning. He became gravely ill. Norman Bethune died on November the 13th, 1939. He had been in China just 22 months. He was 49 years old. I only learned this after we shot the stuff in China from Dr. Robert McClure, that McClure had met Bethune the first few months that Bethune was in China and had given him sulfur drugs and he could have saved his own life using the sulfur drugs so that when Fong says, this is the time for you to use the sulfur drugs. Bethune said, oh, don't be silly, I used them up long ago on the wounded. And it was then that McClure said, I don't care what problems this man had, he was a saint. A man like Churchill needed a war. Well, Bethune, silly to say, needed war to show his incredible inventiveness and his character. Chuen, which is Bethune in, uh, in Chinese. When he went there first, when he saw Mao down in Yunnan, the dialect there, Pai Chuen, those three symbols, literally meant white one seeking grace. And when he went north into the Wutai, by the time he had gone through all that business with the model hospital, you see what, what was so wonderful about the Chinese is they didn't put any constraints on him. They let him go. They let him run, and he found his own way back to the center and became incredibly pure. And for whatever reasons, up there, literally, those three symbols, because the dialect changes, meant white one sent to save. And that's what he did. He, uh, he, was, he, was, he was given the opportunity to find grace, and he found it and very purely uh, there in China. On August 4th, 1987, the final scenes of Bethune begin to unfold. Good. I'm going up the camera. Today, there is a cast of thousands. All of the villagers of this valley have come to recreate Norman Bethune's funeral. It's the kind of scene that's been expected from the start. You know, they're really great at organizing big scenes. And they, um, you know, so they're really good at it. It's just, it's our logistics, you know. How many people do we have to get the cameras up the hill? Is that and the only then, no, the other problem is finding the army guys to carry the stuff. They're, uh, they're usually somewhere else. Somewhere else. Stand by! Here we go! Roll the cameras. Okay, we're rolling our cameras. There is still footage to be shot of Bethune's early life in Montreal and Spain, and questions about the budget and the script. But on this afternoon in the Wutai, after four months in China, everything is in its place.
I don't know. Some days I personally think I wouldn't do it again. And the other, why? Many deceptions on many levels, many disappointments. Hmm. My personal disappointments go on a human level, not as much on a film's level. Um, I find it just sometimes not worth it. And what keeps coming, coming up in my mind is, well, after all, it's just a film. But it's, you know, because of the profession we do, because we like it, because, I mean, basically it's all we have done all our lives. We keep on going and doing it. And I'm convinced that once the film is finished, and if, as I hope, it's going to be as good as we wanted it to be, the rest is going to be forgotten, like instantly. I lay the, the blame squarely on our producers, because our producers picked the wrong studio. And their argument will be, well, no other studio wanted to make this picture as a co-production. And my argument is, why didn't you make it as a service deal? And their argument is, we didn't, we didn't have the money to make it as a service deal, no one would give it to us. And my argument is, why didn't you make the script work wonderfully so it was genius, and then maybe someone would, or why didn't you take another ten years to do it so that it was done properly? Do you know, I mean, you, when you only have one shot at something, you got to make sure it works. Because Norman Bethune came to China and worked with the Chinese people and trusted us, we felt great respect for the people making this film. But when the Canadian crew came here, they didn't trust us, they didn't give us enough to do. I think they could have learned a lot from the man they were making the movie about. It's very easy for anybody, whether it's crew or producer or newspaper or writer or whatever, to say it should have been done differently, it should have been done more thoroughly. I can tell you this film is a dream of a lifetime for many people, it's a dream for us as well. We very, very much wanted to do it. We knew coming in that it will not be perfect, that it will have problems. Many of them we tried to solve coming in, many others were hopeful that they will get solved, and many others we just didn't know about. Because you can't know about it unless you're Chinese, unless you live here, unless you're part of the system. Because up to a certain point, you have to rely on your co-producer to deliver what he was supposed to deliver. Otherwise, don't go in and don't do the film. And we decided that we wanted to do it. The first co-production between China and the West has left its mark in many ways. Chao Shu had never seen a motion picture. Now he has a role in one. In his first 85 years, the old Buddhist monk had never even seen his own photograph. Now for Chao Shu, as for almost everyone who's taken part in this experience, China and the movies will never look the same again. Cut it. Cutting. That was better, wasn't it? 450. It looked to me there was a 9 second, yeah. a 10 second, and a 7 second piece. Okay. This piece is it. Okay. Check in the gate. Okay. Yeah. So, so I think that's it for the scene, I have to say. As a matter of fact, I think that's probably it for the movie. Where's Michael? Yeah. Michael, how much light have we got left, Cal? We've got uh, about 15 minutes for the mm -hmm. Nicola, I'm, I'm not going to do the, no. I mean, I can't do it, and I can't think of a way to do it the where it's not done. Um, That's it? No, because I need Norman for it, and Jamie isn't here, and I got to, you know. Call it the wrap.
Do you want me to? Yes. Let's go. Yeah, Pedro. Come on. Call it. Call it, Pedro. It's a wrap! Oh! All right! Oh! That's it! Oh! 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 Oh!